So glycolysis is the conversion from one glucose into two pyruvate molecules. And specifically, per glucose produces two ATP and two NADH molecules. So this is the overall reaction of glycolysis. You don't need to memorize the overall reaction, but you do need to know that glucose is the substrate and then two pyruvates is the product plus AT, two ATP and two NADH per glucose are produced. So all living things, as I said, use glycolysis because it doesn't require oxygen. So both ana anaerobic and aerobic organisms use glycolysis. It has two phases. So it has an energy investment phase, which actually requires two ATP per glucose. And then it has an energy output phase, which makes four ATP and two NADH per glucose. So that's why the net production of ATP is just two. So you see in the net chemical equation here, um, we just have two ATP, even though it actually makes four because it uses up two. And then it makes sense as to why this is called energy investment, because you invest some energy, and then energy output. And here you can see minus two ATP for the energy investment phase, they're used up, plus four for the energy harvesting or energy production. And then NADH is the reduced form of NAD+. It's a cofactor. And essentially, it's an electron carrier molecule, as is FADH2. So FADH2 is the reduced form of FAD+. And these molecules, NADH and FADH2, what they do is carry electrons from these metabolic processes to the electron transport chain. And then those electrons feed into the chain during oxidative phosphorylation and are used to produce ATP. So you can just think of them as electron carriers. Under anaerobic conditions, the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation all stop. Specifically, oxidative phosphorylation has to stop. And then if this stops, then the products of the Krebs cycle and the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex are going to build up and that buildup is going to inhibit the processes themselves. Glycolysis, as a result, is going to speed up to compensate for that so that some um, ATP is still being produced. So overall, in glycolysis, a six-carbon sugar, glucose, is broken down into two three-carbon sugars called pyruvate. The energy input phase breaks this glucose into two three-carbon sugars specifically dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. You'll often see these molecules abbreviated as so. And the energy input requires two ATP per glucose. That's specifically for phosphorylation of the molecules. And so the two 3-carbon sugars that glucose is broken into during the energy input phase are called dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate can continue into the next step of glycolysis, but dihydroxyacetone phosphate cannot. It's basically useless. But because these two are isomers, dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So instead of having these two different sugars, we have an enzyme, an isomerase, that converts one DHAP and one G3P into two G3Ps. So basically during the energy input phase, what we get is two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, which can continue into the energy output phase. So for each glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is a 3-carbon sugar, we get one pyruvate. Pyruvate is also a 3-carbon sugar. Because we, had, we got two of these per glucose, that makes sense as to why we would get two pyruvates per glucose. So during this phase, each um, three carbon sugar is going to release one NADH and two ATP. But we know we got three, two of these, 
three carbon molecules. So in this energy output phase, we get two NADH and four ATP. So remember, energy input requires two ATP per glucose. Energy output, we get four ATP and two NADH, giving us a net energy gain of two ATP and two NADH per glucose molecule. Okay, so this is a pretty useful diagram that has a lot of information packed into it. I know it's a little bit fuzzy, but um, we'll, we'll try and follow it along as we talk about each step and why it's important. So the first step is catalyzed by hexokinase, and it's simply the phosphorylation of glucose at the carbon number six. So it goes from glucose to glucose six phosphate. And this step occurs in order to first jumpstart glycolysis. And you tr uh, glucose 6-phosphate is trapped in the cell at that point. It can't exit the cell because it's charged due to that phosphate group. So this step sort of jump jumpstarts um, glycolysis. And that's why it's important and sort of intuitive that it is the first step. It's spontaneous only because it's coupled to ATP hydrolysis. Because we're coupling it to ATP hydrolysis, it does have quite a large negative delta G, making it an irreversible step. So what that means is it can't just go in the reverse direction using the same enzyme. So that's the step here. ATP is hydrolyzed and one of the phosphate groups is transferred to carbon number six of glucose. Remember I said you'll often see magnesium alongside ATP and we see that here. The next step is just an isomerization. So we turn glucose, which is a six-membered um, ring, into fructose, which is a five-membered ring. That occurs via phosphoglucose isomerase. So you see that here. The step after that, um, fructose 6-phosphate, is phosphorylated, this time at carbon number one. Whoops, so that occurs um, so it already has this phosphate group here, which is at carbon number six, and then it gets phosphorylated at this carbon number one. And that's another phosphoryl group transfer, which means, of course, that it requires ATP. This is important because it's the rate determining step of glycolysis. It's the slowest step, and it's also referred to as the committed step. Once this step occurs, the molecule is fully committed to going into the rest of glycolysis. So hexokinase and phosphofructokinase are especially important enzymes, um, and especially phosphofructokinase, because the regulation of glycolysis hinges um, quite influentially on this enzyme. So fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is then split into two three-carbon sugars. As I said, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So you get these two molecules here, but only G3P can continue, so we need an isomerase to convert DHAP into G3P. So in this um, phase here, one glucose yields two G3Ps, which is why from here to here, everything really occurs twice per glucose, because we have two of these three carbon molecules. Then in the next step, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is oxidized. Specifically, an aldehyde of the molecule is oxidized to a carboxyl group. And you can see that here is the aldehyde in G3P, and that's oxidized. You know that if a molecule is oxidized, some other molecule must be reduced. And the molecule that's reduced is NAD+, and that becomes reduced to NADH, and that's our electron carrier molecule. Energy that's released by the redox reaction is actually also used to incorporate an inorganic phosphate group to the molecule. So here, we incorporate another phosphate group, as you see, but it's not um, explicitly requiring the use of ATP because it does so using a free-floating phosphate group. So here's the phosphate group in its acidic form. So with two additional hydrogens, but you can think of it as just an inorganic phosphate that's um, floating in the cell, and that's incorporated into the molecule. In the next step, phosphoglycerate kinase, remember kinases add phosphate groups, 
transfers the phosphate group from this molecule to ADP, forming ATP. So you see we incorporated a phosphate group and the phosphate group we incorporated is immediately used to phosphorylate ADP, forming our energy molecule. And this formation of ATP is called substrate level phosphorylation. So as opposed to oxidative phosphorylation, which you'll learn about in a later lecture, um, this is just forming ATP by the direct transfer of a phosphate group from one molecule to another. That is in contrast to oxidative phosphorylation, which requires oxygen and ATP synthase. Then in the next step, um, we go from 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate just via a um, transfer of the phosphate group via a mutase. So these two are isomers of each other. In the next step, 2-phosphoglycerate is converted into phosphoenol pyruvate, often abbreviated PEP, by an enolase. So you see I'm just bolding these words to show you that um, although it seems like there's a lot to memorize here, a lot of it's intuitive and if you understand why each step occurs and why it's important and also see the relationship between the names of the isomers and the steps themselves, it'll make it a lot easier on yourself. And that occurs via the removal of a water molecule. So here an enolase um, forms phosphoenol pyruvate, removing a water molecule. Then we just have one step left, and that last step is catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, which transfers the final remaining phosphate group from PEP to ADP, forming another ATP molecule through substrate level phosphorylation. And then that also yields the end molecule pyruvate here. So you see the formations of ATP that occur in glycolysis are via substrate level phosphorylation, just the direct transfer of a phosphate group from the molecule to ADP. And something um, that I have briefly mentioned but that is pretty important for glycolysis is this term irreversible steps. Those are the steps that have an extremely large negative delta G, meaning they're very favorable in the forward direction and as a result, they can't be easily reversed using that specific enzyme. So, whoops, what I mean by that is using hexokinase, you can only um, go from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, not the reverse. So these irreversible steps, there's only three of them, um, those are going to require a different enzyme to catalyze that step when we look at gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is simply the reverse of glycolysis. So any steps that aren't irreversible are of course reversible. And those reversible steps can occur in both directions using that enzyme, which means that enzyme is gonna be common to both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So let's talk about regulation, which is pretty important. Which steps are regulated? Well, it makes it easy. The steps that are regulated are the steps that are irreversible. And you should know what each um, enzyme is inhibited or activated by. And it makes sense which molecules are gonna activate glycolysis and which molecules are gonna inhibit it. So let's talk about that. So hexokinase, which catalyzes the first step of glycolysis, is going to be inhibited by its product, glycero uh, sorry, glucose 6-phosphate. That makes sense. It's just a form of feedback inhibition. So if a, a lot of um, glucose 6-phosphate is accumulating, hexokinase should probably slow down because if this molecule is accumulating, that means that it's not being used in the rest of glycolysis, and that means this first step needs to slow down in order to match the pace of the rest of the pathway. Phosphofructokinase. So that is the enzyme that catalyzes the what we call the committed step or the rate determining step. So this enzyme here is going to be really important to um, tightly regulate because it really controls the flux of this pathway. So phosphofructokinase is going to be inhibited by ATP and by citrate. So 
if the cell already has a lot of ATP, then glycolysis should probably slow down. Um, because glycolysis, we're using glycolysis in order to create ATP and those electron carrier molecules in order to create ATP through phos oxidative phosphorylation. And so if the cell's already rich in energy, then glycolysis doesn't need to be running quite so much. And then the fact that it's inhibited by an intermediate of the TCA cycle makes sense. Because if, the, if an intermediate of the TCA cycle is accumulating quite a bit, that means that the step that's using citrate in the TCA cycle isn't occurring quite so quickly. And you can kind of assume then that the TCA cycle itself isn't occurring quite so quickly if intermediates are accumulating. And so if the TCA cycle is slowing down, which is indicated by these um, by the increase in citrate, then glycolysis should also slow down. Phosphofructokinase is activated by ADP and AMP. So it's inhibited by ATP and activated by AMP, ADP. That also makes total sense because if ADP and AMP are abundant, then that means that the cell needs more ATP. And also, um, ADP is, is actually one of the substrates that's used in glycolysis. So if a substrate of glycolysis is accumulating, then glycolysis should run to use that up. Phosphofructokinase is also inhibited by, sorry, activated by fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So this is a molecule that isn't directly produced in glycolysis. It's a um, allosteric regulator of phosphofructokinase, and we'll talk about it in a later lecture, um, so kind of put that on hold for now. But essentially, this molecule is really important in regulating um, glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. It's called differential regulation, and we will talk a lot about that. And then finally, pyruvate kinase, the enzyme that catalyzes that last step here, is activated by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And that makes sense because if this uh, molecule is building up, that means a lot of it's being produced. And if the first half of glycolysis is running pretty quickly, then the second half needs to keep up. So here's just another diagram depicting glycolysis. And this one might be helpful for you because it shows the molecules much more clearly than this one here.